always, we start off with some very simple nomenclature. Again, this is the final exam, so it's going to cover everything that we've done, all the functional groups and whatever. You know, final exam really shouldn't be um, traumatic. You should look forward to the final exam for two reasons. First of all, you've already done all this before. Uh, secondly, this does cover the entire semester, which means that um, a whole lot of the stuff that you're going to see on the exam is real simple stuff. Now, at the time it might have seemed challenging, but now it's pretty simple. So it will cover all the chapters and, you know, including all the book, very simple stuff. Um, you also you can make 200 points on it, you know, that, that's good. If you uh, need a few points, that'll help you get back. Um, speaking of points, there are a couple people that wrote and asked about one of the labs that is restricted to only the people that showed up. Could I change that policy? Um, actually, no. Um, but I thought I would tell you that at the end of lecture today, or maybe tomorrow, um, an extra credit will go online. The extra credit is worth 20 points. It's called final extra credit. You'll probably get two shots at it, and again, it, it covers every question um, from all the chapters, etc. Before you start it, make sure you open the uh, drawing palette because you may get a question that requires you to enter a smile string. So make sure you up to doing that. Um, yeah. Now for the extra credit, it'll say like, okay, like eight out of 10 or something. Do you just make it out of like eight out of nothing for the final grade or how does it work? Oh yeah. yeah. The final grade is just points. Okay. So uh, Blackboard sometimes does calculations um, I'm not sure, mind you, I can't see what you see on Blackboard, but um, uh, they sometimes do calculations. Ignore any Blackboard calculations. Only thing that you care about is the total point. Okay, that's the only thing that's important is total points. Sometimes they do running totals and they do percentages and stuff like that. Ignore all of that. Are you sure it was out of 612 or something? I think the syllabus says 620. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and just go through these. These are very simple. Uh, again, we start off with nomenclature. Here we have an alkyne, and it's an alkyl halide. Um, this simply tests whether or not you remember which end to start numbering at. Remember, Double and triple bonds take precedent over simple um, alkyl halides and um, alkyl groups and stuff like that. So carbon one is going to be down here. Um, this is going to be a one, two, three, four, five. So it's a pentyne. It's a one pentyne. And we have a bromine down here in carbon five. So it's a one pentyne with a bromine in carbon five. Very simple. Our next guy, <clears throat> we have an alkene, so we have to include that in our parent chain. So the chain's going to run along here like this. We want to give the alkene the lowest possible number, so we're going to start down here. This is going to be a 1, 2, 3 alkene. And our parent is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's a 2, I'm sorry, a 3 octene. Um, we also have an ethyl group here in carbon 3 and a methyl down here in carbon 6. Any questions? Now this next one is a cyclohexane. Um, there are cycloalkene questions on the exam. Yes, there are. 
you will be doing manipulations of chairs and votes and stuff like that. So make sure that you review all of those things. Um, for this particular nomenclature, where we know that we could do R and S, but we're not. We're going to simply define these two groups as being cis or trans. Um, we want to start off numbering here where our bromine is, because alphabetically it wins. So this is going to be a 3-methyl. Um, the bromine is shown axial, and the methyl group here is equatorial. Um, these are obviously trans to each other, so we're going to call it a 1-bromo 3-methyl cyclohexane. And again, we have to indicate trans stereochemistry. Any questions? Yeah? For day number two, don't you have to put E or Z? Um, no, it doesn't. Because if you look, we have two ethyl groups. Uh -huh. I mean, if you just looked at this carbon, we have two identical groups on it. Oh, okay. So, no E, Z. And, uh, that makes it easy. And for number one, if we had a hydroxide in the place of bromine. If you had a what? A hydroxide, like a hydroxyl group. Oh, okay. What, which one would be the uh, preference? The alkyne? Yeah, the alkyne that is highest priority. It always gets carbon number one, unless there's something higher priority. Next semester, you'll learn lots and lots of functional groups. And uh, oh, by the way, speaking of next semester, um, I actually was told that I'm not teaching 235. Sorry. Uh, that's always my first choice. But, um, but I'm not. I'm not teaching 234 again. So, um, the only thing I, I want to say on that is some people cover chapter 17 as part of 234. Um, you might want to go and check out the archived lecture for chapter 17 um, just to get yourself up to speed. The um, main content that you need to worry about in chapter 17 are going to be Grignard reactions in much more depth than we did in chapter 11. Okay? Just so you know that. All right. Here we have some names, and we're going to draw some simple structures. Um, this is a cyclopentane. We have two methyl groups at positions one and three, and they're indicated as being six. So all you have to do is simply start off with your cyclopentane. Um, I put a couple little branches sticking out so I can show cis and trans. All we have to do is simply make sure they're both on the same side. You don't have that problem? No. Oh. Well, pretend you do. <laughs> Somehow that didn't get printed, I'm sorry. Anyway, so um, this is cis 13 dimethyl cyclopentane. Do you have this guy? No. All right, well then take a moment and do it. What we're going to do here is draw a trans 1 bromo 4 chlorocyclohexane in a chair and in its most stable chair. Now please practice drawing chairs. You've done organic chemistry all semester now. Um, you should be good at this. Um, draw the chair, and we want to put axial and equatorial groups at carbons 1 and 4. Once you've done that, all we have to do is put the bromine and the chlorine um, at carbon 1 and 4, and make sure they're trans, and make sure they are at the most stable conformation. Now, um, carbon 1 and carbon 4, trans stereochemistry. 
they could either both be axial or they could both be equatorial. Obviously, making them both equatorial is going to be the most stable conformation. So we want both of these to be shown equatorial. And all we have to do is put them in. Any questions? Again, we could do R and S on these, except for the fact that are these chiral centers? No, because they both have two CH2s on both sides, going back to one group or the other. The only way that you could do that is if there are like a double bonded something like that, right? Yeah. You yeah, have this guy. Yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and do it. I don't know why those. I have so many sample exam packages that uh, sometimes I grab the wrong one. Very simple. All we're doing is naming an alkane here. It's a pentane. So we're going to come up with a 5 carbon pairing. Again, it doesn't matter how you draw it. I drew it just kind of like that, because I could. You're going to define one end as carbon 1. We need a methyl group in carbon 2, an ethyl in carbon 3. And that's our structure. See, I told you there's always such simple stuff on the final exam. And finally, trans 1, 2 dibromo using a chair and the most stable. So go ahead and draw your chair. Put in the axial and equatorial groups on carbons 1 and 2. That's a question. Now, if we want these to be trans, they have to be on opposite sides, don't they? Um, that means they could either both be equatorial, uh, axial I mean, or they could both be equatorial. Clearly making them both equatorial is going to give us our most stable conformation. So that's what we want to shoot. Oh, and once you decide that, all you have to do is draw them in. And that's your structure. Now, your actual exam will have lots of reactions. Um, I think on the one that I've written, there are like three pages of reactions. Um, I'm not sure, but there's lots of reactions. So make sure you review reactions. This is just a um, set of reactions we'll do uh, to kind of represent what you'll see on the final. This is a uh, very simple set of alkyne reactions. Um, these come from chapter 9. In our first one here, we are taking our alkyne and we are making a ketone. When you look at this, remember we're doing a hydration. A hydration of our triple bond. And when we do that, we're going to wind up with an alcohol. But it's a very special alcohol. It's an enol. So the initial alcohol we're going to get is going to look like this. Remember, the enol undergoes tautomerization. That's a internal isomerization uh, to give us the ketone. Make sure you know how to do that. But this is the enol that we get it initially. So you look at your uh, starting material here, and you ask, where is the hydroxyl group placed? 
Uh, the question refers to Markonikov or anti-Markonikov. We have a secondary carbon and a primary carbon um, in our alkyne here. Uh, this guy is going to be the most stable carbocation. Therefore, this is a Markonikov addition. We remember we can do Markonikov hydration. All we need to do is throw in a little bit of mercury with it. So acid and water, a little bit of mercury too, and we get the enol. Remember, once you get the enol, this undergoes an internal rearrangement, the tautomerization, and this goes to the ketone. All right, our next one, we are taking this alkyne and we are simply adding another carbon onto the end. We know we can do that because the terminal alkyne has an acidic hydrogen. We can react this with a very, very strong base, sodium amide is what we use, and that makes it anionic, carbonyl. We can then use that as a nucleophile in an SN2 reaction or with something like bromomethane. This is the carbon that we're adding. It's one carbon, so that means we need only one carbon in our electrophile, so bromomethane would work. The conditions are simply, number one, make the anion with sodium amide, and number two, react that anion with bromomethane, iodomethane, even chloromethane would work. So, um, if there was another, you know, if there was like an ethyl group after the mm -hmm. triple bond, it would be like CH2. You're, yep, just stick another carbon in. Whatever. You just, you just need an electrophile for an SN2 reaction. Our next one, we're doing a partial reduction here. Now, we don't have stereochemistry here, so we don't really need to worry about if this is cis reduction or trans reduction, but it must be partial. We can do partial reduction two, two ways. We can react with Lenbar catalyst, which is just a lousy catalyst, or we can do dissolving metal. Either one gives us the same product. Lithium or sodium and ammonia, or hydrogen and Lenmar catalyst. Sometimes you'll see Lenmar written as a platinum on barium sulfate. The sulfur um, makes it a very ineffective catalyst. Um, a long time ago, well, to some extent still, you know your catalytic converter in your car has platinum, right? Um, sometimes you can smell your exhaust and it smells very sulfury, doesn't it? Um, especially with cheap gasoline and especially a few years ago. Um, what happens with a cheap gasoline or at least sulfur emissions is that they will bind to the platinum and basically convert it from um, a very good catalyst into Lindlar catalyst, which is lousy. And that's how your catalytic converter can go bad. All right, here we're doing one more thing. We're taking this and we're hydrating it again. Um, again, remember, we're going to make the enol as our first product. So our hydroxyl group here is attached to the terminal carbon. That means it's anti Markonikov. Anti-Markonikov hydration is simply going to be hydroboration oxidation. Remember, our initial product is the enol, but don't show that on the exam. You would take this, convert it to the carbonyl, and remember you do it simply by 
will be taking this hydrogen off, putting electrons in, and protonating at this carbon. Any questions? Uh, for the second one, <coughs> if you didn't have that in the methyl group at the top, like how would you didn't have the second uh, reaction? Then? What? Yeah, if you didn't like if you didn't add in methyl group in the product. The. Yeah, if you didn't have that group in there, this would it here? be SN two or would it not be SN two? Um. No, it, it, first of all, it must be a terminal alkyne. Because all the, uh, the sodium and the uh, nitrogen does, they still like a hydrogen to become an ammonia, isn't it? No. Um, what happens is this makes sodium amide, okay. NH2 minus. Very, very, very strong base. Okay? pKa of about 19. So a strong base. Um, remember, this is sodium previously dissolved in liquid ammonia. It stopped fizzing. It's all done. So it's nothing but a very strong base. This is a CH here, remember, on the end. So this CH gets pulled off by the base simply to make C minus. And that is your nucleophile. All right, some very simple alkene reactions. Well, an alkyne too. Our first one here, we have a cyclopentene, and we have permanganate and acid. We all remember that. Permanganate and acid is a very strong oxidizing group, and we're going to split our carbon-carbon double bond. When we split it in the presence of permanganate, we're going to convert each of the alkene carbons into a carbonyl. So that's step one. They're both going to be carbonyls. The next thing you do is you look at it to see what's attached to the alkene. These are both hydrogens. Whenever there's a hydrogen, permanganate will turn it into a carboxylic acid. So each of these is simply going to be a carboxylic acid. Again, both of them turn out to be carbonyls. Because they have a hydrogen, it's oxidized to the carboxylic acid. That's another way to draw it. A little bit cuter. Again, just make sure you have one, two, three CH2s in the middle. Yeah? Um, could we also draw it with the open ring, but just put the carbonyls on for the COOHs? Yeah. yeah. Just make sure they're carboxylic acids. Once again, we're going to do hydroboration oxidation. This gives us an anti Markovnikov enol. And the anti-Markonikov enol will rearrange to a carbonyl. This has a hydrogen, so it's going to be an aldehyde. Our initial product is the enol. And sometimes on the final exam, I ask you to show this reaction stepwise. So we will do this in the first box. And we'll say, OK, here's our stuff. Um, next, draw the final product after polymerization. So remember, this is going to become a carbonyl. And it's going to look like that. Initially, we get the enol. That rearranges to the carbonyl. Our next one is simple addition of HBr to an alkene. We certainly hope we have lots of those on the final. 
very, very simple reaction. We know this is going to form a carbocation intermediate. Because it's a, if it's a carbocation, we know it can rearrange. Um, here, though, we have a tertiary carbon. So the carbocation will show up here. Bromine will simply add to the carbocation, and we make the alkyl bromide. Question the mm -hmm. first one. Um, if one of the if there was like a methyl group attached, mm -hmm. would it, it would be different? Yes, if there's a, an alkyl group, um, and then it still is a carbonyl, but the methyl group, if that was a methyl group, it just it would stay there. So you make a ketone. So if one of these had been a methyl group, one of these would be a ketone. Yeah. And when do you make uh, uh, CO2? CO2. If we had a terminal alkene, so if this was open chain, open chain. and the uh, terminal alkene had a CH2 on it, um, that will be oxidized all the way to CO2. You can actually rationalize that um, fairly easily. The carbon winds up as a carbonyl, right? We have a hydrogen. I said whenever you have a hydrogen, it goes to an OH. So if we did that twice, we would have carbonic acid, which is CO2 plus water. But partial reduction of an alkyne. Very simple reaction here. <coughs> Um, sodium actively dissolving in liquid ammonia, so it's fizzing. We know this is stepwise. We're going to add hydrogen radicals one at a time. Because of that, we tend to form the most stable alkene. Typically, that is going to be trans stereochemistry. So we get partial reduction and we get trans stereochemistry. Ozonolysis. Ozonolysis also splits a carbon-carbon double bond. We're going to split it there. Once again, each of the alkene carbons is going to be a carbonyl. The thing you have to remember, though, is nothing changes as far as what's attached to that carbonyl. So this has a hydrogen, it's going to stay there. This has two hydrogens, they stay there. Convert each carbon into a carbonyl. Our first one has this guy, still has its hydrogen attached. Our second one, our CH2, this is a carbonyl now. It is simply formaldehyde. With permanganate, Hydrogens are converted to OH. With ozone, they're not bothered at all. All right, once again, this is sodium amide. That sodium previously dissolved in liquid ammonia. Very strong base. We have a terminal alkyne. <coughs> This hydrogen here is acidic. The strong base is going to pull this off and make the um, alkyne anion. This guy is your nucleophile. So in the first reaction, NH2 minus pulls this off and makes the alkyne anion. Once we have the alkyne anion, we're going to dump in benzyl bromide. This is going to be a simple SN2 reaction. The anion is going to attack the CH2. Bromine is going to leave. And we make our substituted alkyne. The <coughs> carbons of the alkyne are these guys on the end. And this is the bond is made in the SN2 reaction. The 
any question? Yeah? Um, why does it attach to that point on the ring? Uh, it's, remember, it's attacking this carbon, not the ring. It's attacking the CH2. This is the CH2 right here. Oh, oh, oh. Hydroboration oxidation, symphalalkene. Now this one is actually a uh, bad example for an exam question um, because you could get multiple products. What I want to make sure that you understand here is that we're not going to get rearrangement and put our hydroxyl group um, on the tertiary carbon. It's going to go on one of the alkene carbons High deboration, oxidation, no rearrangement, remember. So we're going to get anti-Markonikov regiochemistry, but these are both identical carbons. The major product is probably this guy, which means we're putting the hydroxyl group here. Um, the reason for that is that when you do high deboration, first step when you dump in the BH3, you're actually adding boron to three moles of your alkene. So by the time you're done with this stuff, um, your boron has this huge um, mass of carbon things attached to it. So it's big. And it will preferentially go down here simply because it's trying to get away from so it's a steric thing. Um, again, this is a bad exam question. I probably wouldn't put this one on there. Um, and if I did, I would certainly accept this as an answer, too. HBr peroxides. Very, very simple reaction. We know this is going to give us an anti markonikov alkyl bromide. All in the world you have to do here is look at your carbons. Tertiary carbon, secondary carbon, anti-Markarnikov is going to go to the secondary carbon. <clears throat> Don't have to worry about stereochemistry here because, again, we're going to form a radical intermediate. It's going to be planar. Um, and we'll just look something like that. This next one is a problem that I actually do put, or occasionally put on a final exam, simply because it's so simple and people almost always miss it. I don't know why. <laughs> we have an alkyne and we have hydrogen and platinum, okay? That's powerful stuff. And what happens here is we reduce the thing all the way. So we're gonna wind up with the alkane all in the world you have to do is make sure you count the proper number of carbons. We also have a double bond in here. Remember, we can reduce the double bond also with hydrogen and platinum. Therefore, we reduce all of these and wind up with this stuff. You're not going to put this one with stereochemistry in the test. Um, well, this has no stereochemistry. I know, but you're not going to make this one with stereochemistry. Well, I could if I wanted to. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, this first question is designed to test whether or not you remember that dissolving metal reduction works on alkynes but not on alkenes. Here we have an alkyne and an alkene in the same molecule. Um, we will reduce the alkyne, but not the double bond. We also know that this gives us stepwise um, reduction. We get the trans product. Therefore, we're going to reduce this to a trans double bond. It would look something like this. Once again, 
you don't reduce double bonds with simple dissolving metal. Our next guy, we have diiodomethane, zinc, copper amalgam, and we're doing this in ether. Um, this, we recall, is going to generate carbene. Carbene, we remember, is a neutral molecule, CH2. Carbon has four electrons, um, so it's neutral, but the formal charge is uh, zero, but it's very, very reactive because carbon really likes to make four bonds. Carbene will add to the pi system here, bonds to both carbons, and we make a cyclopropane. The cyclopropane is going to go on the ring. It's going to do something like this. <clears throat> this is a very nice way to show it. Um, obviously, the cyclopropane must be on one side of the pi system and these are the original alkene substituents on the other. The other way we know to make cyclopropanes is to use, di, uh, to use chloroform in base. That gives us dichlorocarbene. So pay attention. If this was chloroform in base, you would have two chlorines attached to this carbon. Our next one here, we look and we see, oh, we have an iodoalkane. We also have tert butoxide and tert butanol. This screams at us that we are going to do an elimination reaction, and it's going to be E2. Our challenge here, if this is an E2 elimination, we know that the iodine, that's our leaving group, and the hydrogen here must be on opposite sides of our molecule. So what I would do if I was faced with this is I would redraw this in a Newman. Here I have both methyl groups coming up. Here's our iodine going down. I have an ethyl here and a methyl, and here's our hydrogen. Now, in order to do this, I know I have to rotate this so the hydrogen is now anti and coplanar with the iodine. Because remember, it's a trans elimination. So I'm going to rotate this carbon so it's like that. Again, all I've done is move the hydrogen up, move this down, move this up a bit. Now these two are coplanar to each other. Terpenutoxide is our base. It will simply pull off the hydrogen. This is going to be our double bond. And iodide is our leaving group. If we had to worry with stereochemistry, the nice thing about drawing it this way is that you can instantly see the stereochemistry. Uh, methyl and ethyl are here. Methyl and methyl are here. So our final product. This looks like that. Now, we don't have to worry about stereochemistry here because both of these are identical. Any questions? Yeah? Um, I'm having a hard time picturing this in my head, like the, the final product, the shape of it. Can you count the carbon this for me? Yeah, from like the, the original example or the intermediate? Well, okay, if we start here, that would be carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Thank you. All right, a couple very simple SN2 reactions, right? We have an alkyl bromide, and we have methoxide. That's a good, strong base. Strong base, good nucleophile. <clears throat> nice primary carbon. We're going to do an SN2. All in the world is going to happen is that the oxygen 
is going to attack the carbon, and bromine is going to leave. On the last exam, a lot of people, or some people, uh, drew these things, stupid, um, not showing the oxygen actually bonded to the carbon. Um, please get over that. So oxygen bonded to our CH2, bromine is gone, and we just made the ether. Our next one is also an SN2 reaction. Here, acetate anion is going to be our nucleophile. <clears throat> this is an allylic bromide, nicely reacted for SN2. The oxygen is simply going to attack the CH2. Bromine is going to leave. All we're going to do is make the ester, and the ester would look like that. Again, make sure you show the oxygen nicely bonded to our electrophilic carbon. In bromo 6 cinnamide in carbon tet, the key here is we're shining a light on it, right? We know that this is going to give us bromine radicals. Now, <clears throat> this is an alkene. We know that the bromine radicals are going to add specifically to the allylic positions. The allylic positions here are these guys. Once again, one carbon removed from our double bond. These are very stable radicals. That's why they form. <clears throat> and once we get the radical, We'll simply add bromine to either carbon, and that would be a fine product. Any questions on this set? We have an alkyl chloride and we have violate anion, HS minus. Oh my god, what in the world is this? Well, if this was OH, you would say, okay, nice strong base, as a two reactor. Actually, thiolate is much better. Remember, we looked at our periodic table and said, as you go down the periodic table, the nucleophilicity goes up. So sulfur is much, much better than oxygen as a nucleophile. <clears throat> All that's going to happen here is that the sulfur anion is going to attack our secondary carbon. Chlorine is going to leave. And we're going to make the thiol. HBr peroxide. Well, this is going to give us an alkyl bromide. And the alkyl bromide, because we are doing a radical reaction, will have anti Markonikov regiochemistry. We have a tertiary carbon and a secondary. That means the bromine will go to the secondary carbon. And that's our product. An alkyne, once again, with Lindlar catalyst. Remember, Lindlar gives us partial reduction, so we're going to stop at an alkene. <clears throat> the um, alkene, because it is on a catalyst surface, is going to have cis stereochemistry. Both hydrogens come in from the surface of the metal. Therefore, this is simply going to be the cis alkene. 
Any questions? Now, we look at these guys. These are all going to be elimination reactions, aren't they? Right, they are. They're all terpenes oxide. We're going to get the most highly substituted alkene. That is Sisef's rule. Um, the one thing that we have to do in this, this a little bit unusual, is after we draw the product, we even have to name it. So let's double the fun, right? We are going to do an elimination. It's going to be an E2 elimination. That means that the base is going to pull off a hydrogen that is trans to our leaving group. Hydrogen here and the bromine, I put them both axial. Makes it nice and easy to see it. Terpene oxide simply pulls off this hydrogen. I think so. There it goes. Pulls off the hydrogen. This is where our double bond forms. Bromine leaves. And we make this as our alkene. Step two, we have to name it. Well, it's a cyclohexene, isn't it? It has a methyl group here, so this is just going to be a one methyl cyclohexene. Our next elimination. Again, we have an alkyl bromide. Um, this thing is drawn like this. Uh, later in 235, you will flatten these guys out and make what's called a Fischer projection. In a Fischer projection, you just draw straight lines, but it's understood that all the horizontals are coming towards you. So we haven't done that yet. Step one, I would take and draw this in um, a sawhorse. Again, we have the hydrogen and ethyl up, hydrogen and methyl up, bromine and ethyl down. Step two, we realize that the hydrogen and the bromine must be anti to each other and coplanar. So we're going to rotate this guy in front, so the hydrogen is up. Going to move the ethyl over here, move the methyl down, and it'll look like that. Finally, our base is going to pull off this hydrogen. When it does, we'll form a double bond, bromine aline. Our final alkene. Look at our sawhorse projection here. Ethyl group, ethyl group on opposite sides of our double bond. Can you go back one? The original. <clears throat> so this is what we start with. Again, hydrogen and ethyl up. Hydrogen and methyl also up. Rotate this so the hydrogen is now sticking straight up. Bring our base in, do our elimination. The ethyl groups are on opposite sides of our double bond. So our product looks like this. You want me to number it for you again? Let's just do one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Aerial chemistry, these guys are on opposite sides. Now we have to name this thing, don't we? This is going to be E because they're trans. Opposite sides is simply a 3-methyl 3-hexene. Do you use E and Z versus cis and trans? Well, you really couldn't use cis and trans here very effectively, could you? Because, yeah, yeah. you know, who are you going to say is cis and trans? 
No, you have to use E and Z. Okay. Tests and trans is a simple nomenclature. E and Z is proper. Our last elimination. Well, we're going to do the same thing all over again, aren't we? <clears throat> we are going to move this hydrogen and this bromine. Um, but we have methyl groups everywhere. So we really don't need to fret so much about the stereochemistry. We know we're going to form a double bond through here, pull off this hydrogen, this bromine, and that's going to be our product. Again, because we have two methyl groups, these guys, we don't need to fret so much about stereochemistry like we did up here. Any questions? All right, this is kind of a cute, oh, we didn't name it. Very simply, this is going to be a butene with a methyl group. So that makes it a two butene, two methyl, two butene. This next question I kind of like. Here we have an ether. How do we know to make ether? There's only one way we know. That's the Williamson ether synthesis, and that's an SN2 reaction, right? So we're going to react an alkoxide, that's an O minus, with an alkyl halide of some sort. Now, we could make this ether two ways, two simple ways. The logic here is that this could be the bond that we form in the SN2 reaction, or this could be the bond we form in the SN2 reaction. So take this and split it. And now you're going to answer the question, if this is the bond we form, what was the alkoxide? And what was the alkyl halide? Well, a leaving group had to be here on this carbon, this secondary carbon, right? And the oxygen is on this side of our squiggle, so that was the O minus. <laughs> so all we have to do is draw the pair. Here's our alkoxide, that's this part, and it attacks. The secondary carbon, I put a bromine on, that's fine, good leaving group. Max SN2 reaction, and we make the ether. Now we could do this the other way. If you haven't done this one yet, go ahead and do it. Decide which half is the alkoxide and which half is the alkyl halide. The alkoxide simply was our cyclohexane ring with the O minus. And we just need a leaving group here on this carbon. Again, I made two bromopropane. And this is simply our alkoxide. Isn't that fun? Oh, multiple choice. Everyone loves multiple choice. What's true about SN2? <laughs> Rearrangement. No, 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 no. Don't have to read any further. No, SN2 does not have rearrangement. Intermediate radical. Stop right there. There's no radical. There's no intermediate in an SN2, is there? 
It's concerted. Oh, stable carbon cation. Oops, no. By gosh, this is none of the above. Remember, an SN2 reaction goes through a concerted transition state. There is no intermediate. SN1 reactions. Well, that's different, isn't it? SN1 reaction, concurrent E1 elimination are common. Well, let's think about that. What's the first step in an SN1 reaction? That's making the carbon cation, isn't it? What's the first step in an E1 elimination? Making the carbon cation. So they both have the same intermediate, don't they? So yeah, concurrent eliminations are common. Rearrangement is also common. Well, any time you have a carbon cation, that's going to rearrange if you give it a chance. Reaction is favored by polar protic solvents. Once again, you're going to make an ion. You've got to break this bond. You want something polar to do that. All of these are correct. Yeah? Protic just means polar? Protic? What is Protic. Um, that is an OH. Yeah. Water, ethanol, stuff like that. You know, things that can form, <coughs> that, that can help the um, <coughs> leaving group, the bond of the leaving group, just break by itself. When you break this, you form ions. If you can solvate the ion, that's a good thing. What's true regarding E1? <clears throat> well, let's see. Spheric effect, the least substituted alkene is typically formed. Oh, that would make tricep roll over, wouldn't it? No, we're going to rearrange this thing as much as we want and we're going to form the most highly substituted alkene. Uh, elimination occurs antiparaplanar or trans? No, <clears throat> because we've already lost our leaving group, haven't we? SEP1 and E1, the leaving group is gone. In E2, it has to be trans because they leave together. But in an E1, leaving group's gone already, so that's not right. Sterically hindered bases tend to favor elimination over substitution. That only makes sense, doesn't it? Think of our butoxide as big, it can't get in there, it's going to do elimination. Which is true regarding this reaction? Well, let's see. We have in this reaction an alkyne, and we have BH3 in an ether, THF. So we're not doing hydroboration oxidation. We're simply doing the hydroboration step. OK. Workup with alkaline peroxide gives an aldehyde. That is the oxidation part, isn't it? Alkaline peroxide is the oxidation. This is going to be anti-Marconikov, so the OH is going to go on the terminal carbon, and that'll give us an aldehyde. So yeah, that looks good. <clears throat> Work up with aqueous acid yields a rearranged ketone. Well, that's nonsense. Um, Again, hydroboration, we do not have rearrangements, do we? So you can scrap it right away based on that. Um, and there's no way in the world we could get the ketone anyway. If you take the borane intermediate here and dump in aqueous acid, we actually talked about that very briefly. What happens is you get a hydrocarbon. So you don't put an OH on at all, you put a hydrocarbon. 
in the borate intermediate. The boron will be bonded to the benzyl carbon. I got to think about that one, right? Boron is bonded to the same carbon that becomes the oxygen, the alcohol, the enol. Now we know that the OH group is going to go on the terminal here. So that means that this must be where the boron is. Only proper answer is A. All right, reaction of an unknown with acidic potassium permanganate gives a carboxylic acid and CO2. Now, acidic permanganate, we talked about this, we know it's going to split our double bond. If we are getting a carboxylic acid out, that means that one of the alkene carbons must have had a hydrogen. If we're getting CO2 out, that means that the other alkene carbon must have had two hydrogens. So, tetra-substituted alkene? No. Disubstituted? No. Trisubstituted? Terminal alkene with one alkyl substituent. That's what we're dealing with here. This is a CH2. This will go to CO2. This will go to the carboxylic acid. Now remember why I said you should always look forward to a final exam, because it covers all the simple stuff too, right? Like isomers. Oh my gosh, we could do isomers all day. Which of the following are isomeric? Um, all you have to do here is learn to count. We have seven carbons here, and we have 12 hydrogens. We have seven carbons here, and we have 12 hydrogens. Seven carbons, 12 hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons, but only ten hydrogens. So which are isom isomeric? A, B, and C. Another drop dead easy one. Conformational isomerism in cyclohexane. In general, most stable will have the greatest number of equatorial. We know equatorial is good. Axial is bad. Ring inversion requires complete 180-degree rotation. Gee, that's going to be tough to do in a ring, isn't it? Equatorial substituents are disfavored. You can stop reading right there. A is our only correct answer. Our next guy. We are given a boat. And in the most stable conformation, what's going to happen? Well, we're talking about what groups are axial and equatorial. Clearly, what you have to do is take your boat and either mentally or on paper draw it into a chair. So let's do that. I'm going to just draw a target chair. So I put axial and equatorial groups here for these guys. Okay? Now, the simplest way Really, the simplest way, once you get this drawn, is to look and say, hydrogen is going to be above the methyl. Hydrogen is going to be above this methyl. 
So we can simply put them in here. Hydrogen above methyl, hydrogen above methyl. And I left this thing looking just like it did, sticking up there. Now this guy is going to rotate down, isn't it? When it does, the methyl group is going to be above the hydrogen. That's never going to change. So methyl above hydrogen, down here. Simply rotate it down, and this is what we get. Now, let's look at our things. Two of the methyls are axial. Well, that wouldn't be very stable. Two out of three, that's bad. Two are equatorial. Well, I see one and two. That's good. That one works. All of them are axial. All are equatorial. Obviously, B is the correct answer. Any questions? Another very simple, my gosh, remember Newman projections, how they used to be so challenging. <clears throat> All we have to do is convert this guy into a Newman. Let's see, I say carbon-4 is the front carbon, that's going to be this guy, and carbon-3 is going to be the back carbon. <laughs> so step one, you have to number your alkane. Well, we can do that. It's going to be carbon-1 down here. which means that 3 and 4 are these guys. Now, carbon 3, or carbon 4, is the front carbon. So that's him right here, okay? That's the one in front. What's attached to carbon 4? We have two hydrogens and a methyl group. So we go here to carbon 4, and we put in Two hydrogens and a methyl. Carbon-3 is the big guy here on the back. We're going to do the same thing. We simply look at carbon-3 and say, what's attached? Well, carbon-3 has two hydrogens and this isopropyl group. Now we want this most stable, so we're going to put the isopropyl anti to the methyl, and the other two are just hydrogens. There's the hydrogens, and this is the isopropyl. Remember, front carbon, back carbon. Remember formal charges. We could do formal charges, remember? Here we have NO. No. What is the charge on each of the atoms? Well, first of all, let's think about NO. Nitrogen is here in group. 5A. Oxygen is in 6A. 5 plus 6 is how many valence electrons? 11. Oh my gosh. Only 11. We're going to put the um, octet on the nitrogen. Oh, on the oxygen, because it's the most electronegative. Okay, so let's go ahead and convert this little thing here into a uh, Lewis diagram. Here's our oxygen. We've drawn it with an octet because it is the most electronegative. And here's our four nitrogen missing one electron. 
This is why NO is such a reactive molecule. It's a radical, isn't it? We know that radicals are reactive. Okay, formal charge. How do we do formal charges? We have a uh, formula for that. Um, don't really need it, though. Uh, what we're going to do is split our bonds, our covalent bonds, and just distribute the electrons evenly. Now, we look at the atoms, and we ask how many electrons are around each one. For the oxygen, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. For the nitrogen, that's one, two, three, four, five. Now we look at our periodic table. Hydrogen is group five. Oxygen is group six. Gee, I think they're happy. Nitrogen on the periodic table has five electrons. It has five electrons here. Its formal charge is zero. You can also do it by the formula here. Start off with group five, subtract two of the bonding electrons, three non-bonding, and you get zero. I think it's easier just to do it in your head. The oxygen, the same way. We have six electrons around it. It is a group six element. Therefore, its oxidation number, formal charge, is zero. Any questions? General chemistry all over again. All right, draw these in their most stable. Fairly simple. We look at this guy and say, oh my goodness, this is drawn with a terse butyl group axial. We know that that is a very bad thing. So in our most stable, this must be equatorial. <clears throat> when this goes equatorial, everything else is going to swap. Everything that's axial will become equatorial. Everything that's equatorial becomes axial. All axial groups will become equatorial. I have drawn this in an inverted chair with one, two, four positions showing their um, axial equatorial bonds. Over here, we're going to put the butyl group equatorial, hydrogen axial. The methyl group here was axial, so it is now equatorial. And the bromine with equatorial, so it is now axial. Just start off by drawing this, and then remember you flip everything. Here we have to do two steps, two operations, because we have a boat. <coughs> Our terp-butyl group here, once again, is going to remain equatorial, which means that this guy is going to flip. So <clears throat> if we leave the terp-butyl group equatorial, and we just draw a simple 1-4 structure, all we have to do is fill in the pieces. <clears throat> terp-butyl group will be equatorial, putting the methyl up top. Here, hydrogen is above methyl. Therefore, in this one, hydrogen will be above methyl. Yeah. 
Just remember, turf butyl, equatorial. A couple more here. We want these in the most stable. Well, we look at this and say, oh my goodness, what has he done? Put two bromines axial. Bromine is big. Don't like being axial. So we're going to simply redraw these things, and we're going to make the axial groups equatorial. Once again, just redraw a ring, showing bonds for 1, 3. On this guy, our bromine will be equatorial, pushing the methyl axial. And on this one, the bromine will be equatorial, pushing the hydrogen axial. Any questions? Our last one. <clears throat> Once again, we're going to have to um, convert this so that we get the proteins, if we can, um, equatorial and the methyl group. Uh, well, we'll have to just see where it goes, won't we? Let's start off just by drawing a structure. <clears throat> Get to deal with these three carbons. So this carbon, bromine, is going to be above the hydrogen. That's going to put it equatorial. On this guy, hydrogen is above bromine. That'll push it axial, actually. And this one, hydrogen above methyl, hydrogen axial, methyl equatorial. And it would look like that. We're left here with two equatorial, one axial. Not a happy structure. But if we did a ring inversion, both of these would go axial, and this would be equatorial. You're all sophisticated enough to know that this doesn't sit there and live like a um, perfect little chair. This is going to be warped up a bit trying to all get away from each other. Thank you. Any questions? Wasn't this fun? Now, I hope that everybody sat here and said to themselves, oh my goodness, we did all of this and we didn't do any stereochemistry. I feel cheated. Right? Don't you feel cheated? Good. I would. Therefore, part two of the final exam looks like this. The keywords up here take home stereochemistry. <coughs> Isn't that exciting, too? So you don't have to feel cheated. <laughs> So the day of the final. Right. So make sure you're here. Make sure you can this thing in. And then we'll do the other part of our class. Um, as I mentioned, <laughs> there will be something on Blackboard as soon as I get it written. Um, probably uh, tonight, maybe tomorrow. And it will be called, oh, gee, that's right, I'm leaving town tomorrow. So it pretty much should be tonight. Or, to, well, okay, nonetheless, 